Well, good evening. We're going to have part three of, of the Hebrew in the Star series. And this one is going to be focusing on Yahweh. We've done sort of laying the groundwork past couple of nights. And now we're really going to be able to look at the constellations and connect them with the proto-Synatic or proto-Canaanite Hebrew letters. And that's always a lot of fun. I don't promise this week that we're going to cover every letter. What we are going to do is go thematically. And um, I do uh, believe I have every letter uh, figured out or affiliated. And sometimes the letters even repeat. After all, um, there is uh, when Yahweh wants to show that something's extra important, he does it in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So it's not uncommon for that to happen <clears throat> in the heavens. But, uh, and I'll be showing you a case tonight where actually one Hebrew letter is repeated in two different constellations. Let's start off with prayer, and then we'll see about Yahweh in the Hebrew and stars. We praise you and thank you, Heavenly Father. You are the Almighty. You are our Creator. We worship you. We praise you. We seek that you would be solely sovereign in our hearts, in our homes, and that you would cleanse away from us any defilement. And that is what this week is all about. But Father, we want that to be our condition in you at all times. And I just pray that we will more and more be filled with your spirit, quickened with your spirit, and that we will be citizens of your kingdom. Now, thy kingdom come in the earth of us as it is in heaven, we pray. Bless us as we study, help us to discern and understand, and walk by whatever you have for us. And we praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Psalms 33, 6, we read, By the word of Yahweh were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And I think we see a little deeper level of understanding on that verse, because literally the word is in the heavens, and the Hebrew letters are there. They were the first asterisms. And so we know that um, from the time of the fall to the first um, penning of any scripture, on parchment, on skin, on stone, um, which happened with Job, that, that was 2,000 years. And during that time, the written word of Yah existed. It was in the heavens, and I believe that it very, was, very much was likely that Yah was teaching his people to read and write at the same time as learning the constellations. And it all started for me with a question, what if the original asterisms were ancient Hebrew letters? And I explained why I started asking that question. It was because I had a fascination for caves. <laughs> and, uh, and I started to get a fascination for caves when I discovered that caves were about the sky. And that that is largely so. 
cavemen <laughs> knew the Maseroth, and that gave me quite a heart connection with them. I was like, these people who did these paintings, I think these were God's people. And it was just really cool. Now, I can't prove that they were Yahweh's people, but um, I think it's pretty strong evidence. And then, um, in, in just breadcrumb trail after breadcrumb trail, the Father helped me to see um, carvings and things that happened as we were studying and placing the camps where the children of Israel traveled in the wilderness. And as we did that, archaeological evidence, carvings in rocks, um, where Joshua likely was um, a political prisoner in Egypt. Um, he, was, he would have been likely on the borders of Egypt. And it was a mine. And um, it was where they put people who they really wanted to get, get them far. And anyway, there, there's some evidence that maybe he was there. But Hebrew people definitely were there. And you will find these uh, letters in the, in the mines. And um, anyway, so that caused me to pay attention to these letters. And then when I began to see that, in fact, these letters were actually, even by the scientific community, known to be the original alphabet, I now have a question. Every time I have a question, I always think maybe I won't know the answer this side of glory, and then Yah does something. Do you know what my first question was regarding the Maseroth? I read in Psalms how it says that Yahweh named the stars and constellations. And my question was, I wonder what he named them. And I didn't think I could find that. And I haven't found them all. That Some of them are lost in time, but, but quite a few. And I was so excited. Wow, Yah, you preserved that information for people like me to find. No, not a scientist, not an astronomer. And then the next question, what if... <laughs> you ever ask those kind of questions and then... Yah just knocks your socks off with the answer. And so uh, it was an interesting thing. And here's one of the quotes. This is just from Wikipedia, but I gave you quite a few. Protosynatic, also referred to as proto-Canaanite, was found in Canaan or early alphabetic. It is considered the earliest trace of alphabetic writing. And my question now is, what if that is the language of heaven? Now, I really don't think we're going to know that one, this side of glory, but then <laughs> I'm not going to say that anymore. <laughs> all I know is that it was the mother tongue on earth and that all language came out of it. And then when I began to see that in the caves, which are sky maps, the Lascaux Cave in France is a famous one. And um, people have gone down there and examined them. One of them is French re researcher Chantal Ajug uh, Volkovitz, and I probably got that name wrong, but anyway, um, no disrespect to her. She went and looked in the cave, and she said that if the cave was made of glass, that the dots where the stars are represented in that cave are so perfectly placed that it would be an exact location of where the heavens were. And they did this in the time of the patriarchs. They think 40,000 years ago, you know. Anyway, <laughs> but... They were studying the heavens. They were paying attention to these constellations. And guess what else is found in the caves? Symbols, writing. One of the oldest systems, they say, of graphic communication in the world. Uh, this is from um, Edwin Glo Goebel, excuse me, The Origin of the Alphabet. And he says, the protosynatic or proto-alphabet is also a zodiac calendar. Zodiac is the pagan word. It's Maseroth, which aligns somehow with constellation, celestial constellations and or asterisms. Meaning, if you could figure out, because the asterisms have changed so much over the years, if you could figure out which ones to go with. And so the academics are trying to figure it out. And one of the ways that I've seen them do it is they try to take the signs that people use it in horoscopes to represent Virgo and Libra. And, and they say, well, you know, that kind of looks like if you put these two letters together, maybe that's that sign. And I'm just like, ah, we don't need to go to paganism to find the answers. That's not where it is. But if you go to the word of Yah, you can find the answers. And so 
um, they know now that the, that the constellations connect with the original letters but they just don't know which one connects with which letter. And that's what we're going to be excitedly studying for the rest of the week. I say excitedly because I think you love this stuff like me. <laughs> All right. Um, and this one is uh, Brian R. Peller on the origins of the alphabet. He said, the ancients looked to the skies in a way that we will never quite understand today. I disagree. The night sky was seen as a blackboard on which the gods first chose to illustrate and illuminate their wisdom and the creation of all things past, present, and future via patterns of light that formed pictures, letters, or words. And so, yes, ancient Hebrew is in the sky. That uh, proto-Canaanite, proto-Synatic um, alphabet, those letters, they are an, an early form of Hebrew. And so by the word of Yah, were the heavens made, really. Now tonight, um, we are going to be focusing on the first, Yahweh. Always start with Yahweh. So we um, have already looked at the Maseroth. Now in the 12 primary constellations, these are the ones that are representing each of them, represent one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Each of them have three deacons, so it makes a total of the ancient 48 constellations. Today there are 88 constellations um, that astronomers um, calculate. So people have made up a bunch of stuff and they've changed some of the ancient depictions of the constellations. And that's why um, when I made this drawing for the book, I had to restore prayerfully what you can find from the ancient planispheres. This is the way they represented them. And so it was doubly exciting for me to begin connecting it with the letters because these, these constellations have shapes, they have meaning, and people have always asked me, how do you absolutely prove that that constellation is that? And yes, you can show it from scripture and you can show them from planispheres that go back to ancient Egypt. You can show those things, but how do you really prove it? Well, I think when you can connect it to the meaning of a, a Hebrew letter, that it just takes that thing so much deeper. It's one more layer. So we studied the Aleph last night, and we saw that the Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and certainly one of the representations of Yahweh, that this letter is an asterism in the bull's head. Okay? And the bull represents the strength of Yahweh, his great strength, which is primarily demonstrated in, in this constellation, the whole constellation family. The st this star family means this is second coming. This is uh, seven last plagues. This is Yah is so strong that he will take down the anti-Messiah. Yah is so strong that he will take down the kingdom of hell. Yahweh is so strong that he will save his people. And did you know the second exodus is said in scripture to be so great that it will be told all throughout eternity and the first exodus won't even come to mind. It will be pale compared to the second exodus. And so he is the one bringing about the second exodus. And by the way, it's not Israel on this earth. It is to be taken off world. The only way to go on this exodus is a spiritual journey. <laughs> All right, and the mighty Aleph, he is doing it. So, of course, we've already looked at this aspect of Yahweh in the heavens, this portrayal of him, and let's press on from there. Another portrayal of Yahweh in the heavens is in the constellation that they call Boutez today. Um, Arcturus is there um, between the knees of Boutez, and that's one of the brightest stars in the sky. Um, when you look for it in the night sky, you kind of see a kite, you know, shape, sort of. And uh, Arcturus is, um, well, this, this constellation is part of the early star family. It's part of Betula's star family, the Virgin. Now, this particular constellation actually has two Hebrew letters in asterisms because it is depicting Messiah, Yah, in his two roles. The first is the Lamed. Do you see the shepherd's crook? Mm -hmm. It's straight up right there. 
very hard to miss. And the second one has been distorted a little bit, but I think I can strongly su support that this is what it is. In the picture, he's holding a sickle, but do you know what they call Boutez? They call him the plowman. Why? There's no plow. There's nothing like that. It's because even today, there is a linguistic connection to the fact that this is the Zayin. And one of the meanings of Zayin is not only weapon, but plow. And so he is the exalted plowman to this day, although no depictions ever show him with a plow. But he's got a Zayin. <laughs> and one of the meanings of Zayin is plow. So I thought that was interesting. Um, okay, so we're going to be looking at two Hebrew letters, but let's begin with Boutez, or Bo, as it is in Hebrew. Now, the Greeks call this constellation Boutez, which means the plowman, and I think we see why. Otherwise, it's just kind of scratch your head. What's plowman about this? Zayin is the connection. The original Hebrew name was Bo, which means coming one. And this, of course, is a reference to Yah, who is coming. And he is not a plowman. He is watching over a flock of sheep, which they've misnamed as bears. And I know if you're looking at the book, God's Amazing Star Secret, you're going to see Bo on this side of the page, and you're going to see the sheep on the other side of the page, and that's when you have to remember it's a sphere. They touch. Okay? <laughs> so the sheep are with the plowman. <laughs> All right, outside of the paper, goes together. So the Greeks taught, again, that Boutez held a plow, and they weren't that wrong, were they, since it's the Zayin. He also holds a shepherd's crook, and that is, um, we know that that's what it is, because one of the stars in Arabic is al Katarops. The Hebrew name is, um, is in the book, but... Al Kadarops is what it's mostly known as today in astronomy. And that means the rod or shepherd's crook. So he's holding the Zayin sickle and he's holding the rod or shepherd's crook. And this shows the dual role of Yah in our lives. It demonstrates that Yeshua will be not only and is our great shepherd, but also the judge and the harvester of souls. And just as the Zayin means, it means to plow. And it also means to cut off. And to be cut off is to be eternally dead. Yeshua, when he died for us, the Bible says in Daniel 9, that he would be cut off in the midst of the week. And it has to do with taking that, that step into that judgment death. All right, so let's look at the shepherd's crook. The Lamed is the 12th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it has the sound of L, kind of like as in look, and it has the numeric value of 30. And as you can see, the ancient way that it was drawn looks like the shepherd's staff or goad. And uh, today, the um, classical Hebrew script is constructed of the kaf with a vav standing on top of it. But of course, our focus is on the Paleo-Hebrew, as they sometimes call it, or the scientific community would call it Proto-Synatic or Proto-Canaanite. And so this is a unique letter in the Hebrew alphabet since it is the tallest letter. And it's the only letter that rises above the baseline when you're looking at Hebrew text. And um, it's the 12th letter and is considered the central letter or heart of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and Lamed 30 means the teaching of Yahweh, the learning of Yahweh in Torah. And learning is not an end in itself, but it should spur us to action. For example, um, we read, study is not the ultimate good, rather the deeds. In other words, a true student or learner is not one who is entirely bookish, but someone who can apply what he has learned. And so uh, that's the concept. So in light of this, we can see that the word Lamed is connected with Malmud, which is a goad or spur to action. And like a wise shepherd, learning will spur us on to good deeds. It's also interesting that when um, we say, when the Bible says, keep the commandments, keep the statutes, the word keep is shamar, which means to hedge about as with thorns, and it means to goad 
as in with an ox goad, as in smack me, Father, if I'm getting out of line, please, in your mercy, keep me in the safety. I think it's kind of cool, the hedging about as with thorns as well, because there's a very graphic portrayal of that in Africa. Um, it used to be, I don't know if it's still done, but when they would be going across the wild territories um, out on a, in the safari regions, um, there would be lions hunting at night and dangerous things. And so they had these, these big, very pokey weeds, and I don't remember what they are called, but they would pile them in big piles all around them in a ring. And then they would sleep inside, and nothing would come through that terribly prickly wall. And that's literally what it is, to hedge us about with thorns. Keep the, the lion predator, which is Satan, out. So teaching is a role that Yah has in our life. He is teaching us, and it's necessary. If we don't learn of him, if we are not instructable, if we are rebellious, then we have the Zion, the one hand, the teaching, the leading into life, the nurturing, and the other hand, no more wickedness. And you see both portrayed in Bo, the coming one. So it says, and now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you. And um, it's interesting that if you write out the word lamad, um, it comes from the root uh, meaning to teach, and it's in Deuteronomy 4.1, as we just read. And so teaching, Yah, Yah says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is they that bear witness of me, John 5.39. In other words, if you're studying and learning Torah, it is meant to ultimately reveal Yah. He's in it. And if we don't see him in it, then we have missed the shepherd's crook. You know, I, <laughs> I remember um, there was a, a Torah-keeping group. I'm going to try to keep this really careful. And um, the leader of the group um, took the law, very letter of the law. And Yah is always about spirit of the law, by the way. That doesn't mean that um, obedience is not what we're talking about, but we have to understand the spirit of something. So anyway, letter of the law. He had this chair, and this person was perhaps paid, perhaps volunteered, followed him around at the feast gathering, carrying the chair so that he could put it down for him whenever he was going to sit. And then he could sit on this chair that was his chair, and only his chair, and nobody else would touch his chair. And... The concept is that in the Torah, it says that if a woman has an issuance of blood, you're not supposed to be. So he was afraid that a woman might touch and defile that chair, and he believed that he was keeping the Torah. And Yeshua shows us what the spirit of the law is. He has a woman with an issuance of blood, and she comes and she reaches out and touches the hem of his robe. Is he defiled? Does he punish her? He said, I felt virtue go out of me. Who touched me? Virtue is power. And she's like, I touched you. <laughs> because she was so used to being thought of as a pariah. You see, the spirit of the law was about protection of the congregation from disease, and the life is in the blood, and also lots of disease, and it was a protection. It wasn't a, oh, you stink, you stay back there wasn't like that at all. And if we um, think we're learning the Torah when we are not learning the character of Yeshua, those two things are connected. We have something missing big time. So um, the way they do the Lamed today, um, you can see that they have the Kaf at the bottom and the Vav at the top. And, and again, it's the number... Um, 30, but interestingly enough, the Vav and the Kaf together are 26, and 26 happens to be the numeric value when you add up the letters of the Yod, the He, the Vav, and the He. And so Lamad is central and raised above all the other letters, and it represents Yahweh or the King of Kings. 
And this indeed, Botez, Bo, is the king of kings returning. He is the king of kings who shepherds his flock. And he said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And he is watching over his people, protecting his people. The word Yisrael, or Israel, begins with the smallest letter, Yod, and ends with the largest letter, the Lamed, and suggesting that Israel's dependence upon Yahweh is very much being graphically portrayed in how the word is written. In fact, in Exodus 19.5, the scribes write a deliberately oversized Lamed and a deliberately undersized Yod right next to one another. The Hebrew word uh, on the screen reads, and you shall be to you shall be to me a treasure among all peoples. And Israel is Am Segula, a treasured people, when they keep the covenant of Yahweh by acknowledging his goodness and Israel's smallness. His greatness and Israel's smallness. That is, Yah is the great Lamed, the teacher, the king of kings, the shepherd of the soul, and Israel is the small Yod, the hand extended up to heaven in praise, in worship, and empowered by Yah to do his works. And when the relationship between Yahweh and us is like this, then we are Israel, the treasured possession to Yahweh. In Deuteronomy 29, 28, there is an oversized Lamed in the um, writing of Hebrew in the Torah. And this reads, and he cast them into another land. This oversized Lamed suggests that Israel's rebellion against Torah resulted in their ejection from the promised land. But even this punishment would be used by Yahweh to greatly teach them about his greatness. And in the last days, we behold the manifold wisdom of Yah as he gathers spiritual Israel back to Torah, back to the center stock, which is Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the trunk of Israel. He is the one to whom we must be grafted in, not some DNA line, not some latitude longitude line on planet Earth. It's Yeshua centered. And so... Um, we are looking forward to his soon coming as Israel's true king of kings. Now the shape of the Lamed has also been compared to a watchtower. And uh, we see that in the tallness of the shepherd's crook. And so it's like the lighthouse. It's the sentinel at the heart of the Hebrew alphabet as in the Torah scrolls. The, va the base of the Lamed is formed by a kaf, the letter that symbolizes our submission to Yah and obedience, which results in good, grace-empowered works, obedient to Torah. And to form the Lamed atop the kaf sits the vav, which is the shape of a flame. And this shows that our, our spirit-empowered Torah-obedient good works give light to those around us. And this glorifies Yah, and it is sheep following the shepherd, for he is the source of light. And this was the symbology that Yeshua was referring to when he said in Matthew 5, 8, 14 to 18, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house." Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill, which means level up, fully preach, accomplish, perfectly supply. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Have heaven and earth passed? Is heaven going to pass? <laughs> so as the flame-like protrusion stands atop the cough in the formation of the Lamed, so our grace-empowered works shine on the platform displaying the light of Yahweh's truth emanating from the Torah. And Yeshua is the word manifest in the flesh. And so man is filled with Torah understanding. We're going to talk about more about this on the night when we really focus on how the Torah is illuminated in the heavens. You know, connecting these letters and seeing these things has made me so excited about it. I just, I wish I could have been there when Enoch shared at night. Can you imagine going to church 
where Enoch is teaching and it would be church under the stars and him telling the Hebrew letters and their meaning. And it would just stick in the mind because we're very picture oriented. A picture is worth a thousand words. And the pictures are the words. <laughs> it's so cool how Yah has done that. The early Hebrew pictograph is a shepherd's staff, as we've seen, and it's used to direct sheep by pushing or pulling them. It's used as a weapon against predators to defend and protect the sheep. And the meaning of this letter is toward as moving something in a different direction. This letter also means authority. It is a sign of the shepherd, the leader of the flock. It also means a yoke, a staff on the shoulders, as well as a tie or bind from the yoke that is bound to the animal. And so to teach or to goad by implication to teach, the rod being the incentive, um, lead me into thy truth and teach me, goad me with your rod. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. So that's the shepherd's crook. Now let's look at the other asterism in this constellation about Yah in the heavens, the Zion. The modern Zion looks a little bit like an axe or a hatchet, and the ancient one, sorry, more like that. Zion is the seventh letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it has the sa same kind of sound you would say for Z and zebra. And... Um, the, uh, this is the letter of spiritual warfare. Zion means weapon, and its uh, form represents the sword of the spirit. Um, it also is the Hebrew number for seven, and you can... It's a paradoxical word, by the way, Zion, when you write it out, since it means weapon or sword, but it derives its root from a word that means sustenance or nourishment. So the root of Zion is zan, and it appears in words like mazan, which is food. But how is food or nourishment related to the sword or a weapon? <laughs> the sword of spiritual warfare is needed for our continued nourishment, isn't it? Lest the enemy prevent us from being filled in the word of truth. So in order to be nourished and at rest in Yah, we must effectively engage in spiritual warfare. And in scripture... Yeshua is called the word. He's also called the living bread. The word of Yahweh is represented as bread. And it's also rep he's also represented as the sword, for the sword of the spirit is the word of Yah. And so the Zion is a letter signifying cutting off evil, nourishment to sustain life, and resisting and resting from evil. And so um, cutting off evil is very much a part of what uh, Bo, the constellation Bo, is portraying. Yah is doing. He is cutting off evil. He is shepherding his people and he is cutting off evil. And so again, we see this mighty portrayal of Yah in the sky. Is wickedness going to continue? No. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh with the morning. Psalms 149, 2-7, Sing to Yahweh a new song. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. Zion is used to divide, cut up time into units of seven. Shabbat, the seventh day of the week, the week of days. Shavuot, the day after the 49th day, counting from Passover, um, the Feast of Weeks, specifically first fruits in that time. Tishri, the seventh month of the year. Shemitah, the seventh year of rest for the land, the week of years. Yovel, Jubilee, the year after the 49th year, the week of weeks of years. And so then the millennial kingdom, the seventh millennium of human history, seven, seven, seven. Zion is used to cut up time into units. There is an oversized Zion uh, found in the Hebrew text of Malachi 4.4. It says, Remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, that I commanded him in Horeb, the statutes and judgments for all Israel. 
the extra large Zayin is found at the beginning of the Hebrew word for remember. Since Zayin represents a weapon of spirit, remember the Torah of Moses is here depicted as a great weapon to be used in spiritual warfare. And when we talk about wisdom and warfare, we will see much more about spiritual warfare in the heavens. Christians are largely aware that spiritual warfare is vitally important, defining and keeping true freedom in Christ. The devil's a roaring lion, especially working to devour believers. They are most threatening to him and his kingdom, as scripture warns in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Choosing to walk with Yahweh automatically means that we must resist the devil in Yahweh's power. Of course, as it says in James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to Yah, resist the devil, and he will do what? Flee. He will flee from you. So in Proverbs 5.22, we see a direct relationship between the Torah and spiritual warfare. His own iniquities, and what are iniquities? Sins, transgression, or breaking of the law. Shall take, ensnare, imprison the wicked himself, and he shall be holden in bondage spiritually with the cords of his sins. Can we be free without the living in Torah? Can we be free without obedience? Can we be free without Zion, the cutting off of wickedness in our lives? 1 John 5, 2-4, But this we know, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, cuts off wickedness. So in Yah's work, in his work, his spirit in us, wickedness is cut off or we are cut off because wickedness will not continue. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So Zion is a picture of the Messiah. It represents the crowned man, and that, of course, is Yeshua, king of kings, wearing the crown, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And here in Bo, he's also depicted as the shepherd who feeds his sheep. So the two concepts, weapon and nourishment, both illustrate the benefits delivered from God's word, and they are both present in the meaning of the Zayin. It's the, he is, God's word is the living bread, we're spiritually nourished. It's the weapon of defense against the tempter. And this also shows the two sides of Yahweh's care for his people. On the one hand, he's the provider. He is merciful and gracious. And on the other, there are times when he must be stern and even bring the sword of sorrow and trial into our lives in order to bring us to repentance and to refine our characters. Yeshua is both lion and lamb. And you clearly see that in Bo. Shepherd's crook. Zion. <laughs> Romans 2, 4. The goodness of God leadeth thee to what? Repentance. Romans eleven twenty two. 22. Be behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. That's a message of the Zion. And so the paleo uh, Zion, um, this is one way that it's drawn in Egypt. Here you see it looking like a slanted capital I, and the meaning added some amazing depths to the letter message. It was depicted a farming implement, a plowshare, and um, like those that were used in biblical times. And so this shows the nourishing, protecting roles of Messiah. The plow plowshares are beaten into swords. So in Hebrew thought, both swords and plowshares are connected, and they're certainly connected here in Bo. In Isaiah 2, 4, He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Oh, won't that be a good day? <laughs> Just a wow day. The Hebrew word for enemy, sometimes translated as stranger, is sar. The word picture describes an enemy as a weapon man. 
Proverbs 24, 5, Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. Strangers in Hebrew, enemy. And so the letter Zion is used in several significant Hebrew words. And uh, what's the significance of the word for enemy beginning with the letter Zion? It shows that spiritual warfare involves victory over the enemy. And the ultimate enemy is, of course, the kingdom of hell, for scripture tells us that we don't wrestle flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. Another Hebrew word that begins with Zion is the Hebrew word for trim or prune, which significantly is also the Hebrew word for sing. We'll look at that in a moment. The Hebrew word for prune or trim is zamar, and the word picture tells us that pruning cuts off bitterness or cuts off rebellion. It's part of the unleavening. It's part of the circumcising of the heart, cutting off that which cannot go forward. And so the Zion is not just about being eternally cut off. It's about cutting off sin and those who follow Yah and recognize his roles in our lives will receive that work as well. Leviticus 25, 3, six years thou shalt sow thy field and six years thou shalt zamar thy vineyard. And interestingly enough, zamar, spelled a little different in English, but basically very much the same in Hebrew, is the word for sing. Sing praises to Yahweh. Why would sing be the word for prune? Trim, cut off. Well, scripture tells us that Yahweh is throned in the pra- in, enthroned in the praises of his people. So the devil cannot stay in the presence of Yahweh's throne. Singing is a weapon against the enemy, and he is cut off. You remember David playing for Saul when he would have a demon spirit, a King Saul? And uh, the I don't know who sent for David. I don't think Saul did, but it was probably those poor people who had to be with the wicked king in the palace. Where's David? you go get him somebody go get him quick (laughs) the king is in a very foul space and then David would come in and you know he wasn't very well received because Saul would throw javelins at him (laughs) but (laughs) but the singing would take away the evil spirits cut them off for a time and Saul always let him come back Psalms 9-2, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Another Hebrew word with a zayin um, is zakar. And this t- word tells us that remembering Torah, Sabbath, and things of Yah is a part of victorious Christian living. Remember ye the law of Moses. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. This is a part of cutting off wickedness and having the living bread. Okay, so we have looked at bow, and we have seen that there are two asterisms that are Hebrew letters in bow, and they show the roles that Yah has, that he is the shepherd, he is the staff, he's he's the leader uh, of the flock, and the one who rightly has the ability to protect and control And then we have the Zion, that he will plow, break up the fallow ground of the heart, that it is a weapon against wickedness, and that wickedness is cut off by his power, either out of us or us, if we reject the cutting off process and want to keep the wickedness. Because he will not have wickedness. It's going to have an end. All right, another portrayal of Yah in the heavens is to me a particularly beautiful one. This is the king constellation. They call this Cetus today, but um, it's, uh, it's an interesting picture because this is one of the deacons of um, the two fish. They call them Pisces, but it's Dagim. And those two fish represent the two groups of believers known as Philadelphia and Smyrna. Philadelphia, those who are translated without seeing death, and Smyrna, those who are martyred. And both of them are tied by the tails to this horrible sea monster because it's a dragon fish. Fish are supposed to be those who belong to Yah. And dragon, we know who that is. And so these people who are supposed to belong to Yah, Revelation calls them the synagogue of Satan. 
who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. And they have the character of their father. And this is the group, the synagogue of Satan are the persecutors. They have been in every generation. Who is it that came after Yeshua and wanted his blood? Was it the Romans? No. No. Who was it that came after the disciples? Who has always been the persecuting power? No matter what time you're, it's the synagogue of Satan. So this constellation shows that. They claim to be fish, which is baptized, born again, put on Christ, born of water. But they are really dragon-like. And so in this constellation with the two fish and the time of persecution and, and this sea monster is at its full strength and there's martyrs happening and there's all this horrible time, the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. This is a very sobering star family. And in this star family is this constellation. Do you know what this constellation means? This constellation is the Semek. Semek is the hand on the staff, meaning I have the authority. The staff here is a representation of a king's staff. It is authority. It is also support and to prop up something that might be weak if it weren't supported. Isn't that cool? And that's what this constellation means also, that he is there and his right arm, right. In, in, in Hebrew thinking, right is the, is the source of power. You know, people have taken it very, very, very literally. He's not literally bread. He's not literally a vine. And he's not literally a son in the sense that I have a son who didn't always live. Right? But he says, before Abraham was, I am. We, we take his titles and we, we make them very literal and it's not good. One of them that we do is the son stands at the right hand of the father. And I mean, the, <laughs> the occult kingdom, you've got your bad guy in the middle and then he's got his right hand man right next to him. You know, and we have this view. This is the second in command over here. But that isn't what right hand means. In scripture, you have the concept of, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Well, then we'll just stay on the right side. We wouldn't want to go onto the other side. No, <laughs> right hand doesn't mean that. It means he is strong enough to provide it. He is the strength. So when you see his right hand raised and his hand on the staff, it means I am strong enough to support you. You can trust me. I will be there for you on the darkest days in human history, on the darkest days of your life. He will be there. He is going to be the reason we can go through it. That's not only the message of the constellation, but also the message of the letter Semek. This is a picture showing the letter Semek, and uh, this one has the S sound like in sun, and it's the 15th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, having the numeric value of 60, and it looks something like a shield a little bit in the way they draw it today, um, but originally it was drawn to look very much like what you would use to put up a tree branch and support it, and look, there's the picture. And Semek means to support, to prop up, to aid, to assist, to strengthen. Isn't that cool? Semek has an enclosed circular form today because, as they say, it's showing how Yah surrounds, encompasses us. But um, Semek is for Sa'ab. In fact, it's the beginning of the word Sa'ab, uh, which is to compass about. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. It says in Psalms 32, 7. The root of the word, Samek, um, when you write it out, uh, means to lean upon, to uphold, or to support. And the root is also found in the Hebrew concept of Samika, the laying on of hands upon the head of a sacrificial victim in a blood ritual of the temple which is, was also the means of consecrating the priesthood. And so the biblical reference to the root occurs in like Leviticus 16.21, Deuteronomy 34.9, Ezekiel 24.2, and a few other places. And in ancient times, Semek may have represented a shield, but um, this is the ordination ceremony in the Bible called the Semekah. 
Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull because the bull represented who? The strength of Yeshua. Yah, the Alpha, the, the Aleph. And that he would lay down his life and also um, provide for the blood uh, needed for our salvation. And so in laying hands on, it's to say my support, my strength comes from the shedding of blood that is happening here. This death is, is something that will heal me. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance, Psalms 32, 7. Um, that's the concept of also Semek. Um, the eternal Yah is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. That's that right arm of strength, Deuteronomy 33, 27. He that trusts in Yahweh, mercy shall compass him about, Psalms 32, 10. Semek is also the letter for Sukkah, indicating that God's omnipresence is our support and shelter. God actively supports his own, Hebrews 1.3, and we trust in his provision and care. Hebrews 1.3, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of this, his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Power, the power of heaven. The priestly blessing is rooted with a Semek. And the way Hebrew people teach that is because Semek represents the number 60, and 60 is the same number of letters found in the priestly blessing in number 6, 23 to 27. And the text of the priestly blessing recited by the priests appears verbatim in the Torah, and it is, may Yahweh bless you and guard you. May Yahweh make his face shed light upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh lift up his face unto you and give you peace. And that is the embodiment of him supporting his people. It is fulfilling number six, 23 to 27. So we have looked at Yahweh in the heavens and how he is portrayed in the heavens. First, he's portrayed in the mighty Aleph, the bull. He is first, he is strong, he is supreme. He is able to take his people from spiritual Egypt to ultimate Canaan. He is able to bring an end to sin. He is the mighty shepherd and judge. He cuts off wickedness. He leads us, he teaches us the Torah and goads us into truth out of love for us because otherwise we would be destroyed. Yahweh is the one who supports his people in the time of their greatest crisis and need. He will be their strength. Now let's look at one more aspect of Yahweh in the heavens, and that's in the letters of his name. The name Yahweh, Yod, He, Vav, He. We'll begin with the Yod. The Yod is found in one of the deacon constellations to the bull. It's right here in the right arm. Now, interestingly enough, when you look at the carvings in stone of these ancient letters, they can be directed any which way. It isn't always the way you see it in this ni nice, neat little list. The bull's head is not always perfectly proportioned, but you can recognize the Aleph. You know, different people draw different ways. And also, there are times when directing a letter in a different angle or direction draws your attention to something. In fact, in the, in the caves where you have all this star information, a lot of times the direction of the letters helps a person to understand if they're talking about a particular season or something. So there's information in the direction. But in the sky, the yod is coming from the shoulder of Riga, the shepherd, and going down to the hand. And this right arm of the shepherd, the yod, representing the arm and hand and works and deeds of Yahweh, is what has not only caught the fish for the kingdom, salvation, but is also protecting his people, the little sheep, who's only with her eyes does she behold and see the reward of the wicked. He, he wants his people to know, I'm the yod that will keep you safe when the plagues are coming on this planet. Isn't that beautiful? His protection in the Yod. 
When the Messiah returns, people will either be consumed because they have rejected him or they will be safe from all harm in his protecting care. The promise of God's protecting care is given in the third deacon of the bull, Re'im. The constellation called Re'ah, now called Ariga, and it depicts the good shepherd, Messiah, Yah, holding the small sheep in his arms. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. This is his saved people. But having also the symbol of the fish with a fish net, because the saved are represented as sheep and fish and bride with lots of symbols, just as there's lots of symbols for Yeshua. So the sheep in the arms of the shepherd represents every saved person. In fact, on that day, it is God's will that you will be the sheep in his arms, kept safe from the seven last plagues of Re'im. And from the fires of Eshalak that we talked about, the river of fire, during this period of judgment, which takes place at the time of the second coming. The prophet Isaiah wrote that God would protect his people in his secret chambers, the secret place of the Most High, Psalms 91.8. And the eye of the sheep is named for the same kind of words that appear in only with her eyes does the you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Isaiah 40 verse 11 says, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. That's the name of this constellation, Re'ah. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. And in this sky picture, I think maybe Isaiah could have even been thinking of this sky picture to carry them in his bosom because that's exactly what's happening. All right. So the first star there in the little U's head, Alioth, and it has to do with the U lamb. And uh, this, this is found in Genesis 21, 28. We have the Yod, and this is the letter that goes with this constellation. Today, the Yod is drawn more like just the hand, but the original Yod was the arm and elbow and forearm and hand. It's the 10th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And um, I've, I've heard it pronounced a number of ways. Some say Yod, but um, Frank Seekin says it rhymes with Mode, Yod. So that's kind of how I've said it. Anyway, it makes the same sound as Y does in Yes. And the Yod is uh, the 10th letter of the alphabet. And it has the numeric value of 10. The pictograph for Yod looks like an armor hand, whereas the classical Hebrew is just the upward tag, uh, like just the hand. Um, Yod is the smallest of the Hebrew letters, the atom of the consonants, and um, it's the form from which all other letters begin and end, which goes with the hand or works of Yah as well. And in Hebrew understanding, Yod represents a mere dot, a divine point of energy. And since Yod is used to form all the other letters, and since God uses the letters as the building blocks of creation, and we can see, you know what? The Hebrew people are right about that. Um, Yod indicates God's omnipresence. And since Yeshua upholds the world by the word of his power, Hebrews 1.3, Yod is part of every Hebrew letter and therefore every word, and Yod is considered the starting point. And indeed, since he is creator, is not everything his workmanship? The letter Yod, being the smallest of the letters, um, is also a picture of humility. Yod can be seen as a mark of humility in the text that says Moses was the most humble man upon the face of the earth in Numbers 12, verse 3. Now, the man Moses was very meek, and the, there's an extra Yod added into that word in the Hebrew text to show that he is very meek. And the Hebrew scribes who read and write that Hebrew Torah scrolls say that the extra yod is inserted into the word ana, and it means humble or meek, and they emphasize the humility by adding the yod. Also, Israel is called the smallest of nations in Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, and it's considered a type of yod before the great nations of the earth, for you are the smallest of peoples. Yah says, I didn't choose you because you were so big and awesome and smart and wonderful. I chose you because you were the least. 
<laughs> stay humble, right? <laughs> Sometimes we say the bottom of the pickle barrel, he can use the fishermen and probably more easily than the Pharisees. Genesis 2, 7, and Yahweh Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground. Yod is related to work with his hands. Yahweh worked with man intimately to personally form him from the dust of the earth. The other things he simply spoke into existence, but with mankind, he stooped down and personally molded him. The word exist is a derivative of Strong's H1961, Havet, in the Hebrew, and the letters are He, Yod, Vav, Tav, and reading right to left, the word would, the word would look like this, as you see it. And um, in pictograph, ancient Hebrew, um, these numbers are an image of the crucifixion of Messiah when drawn together. The hay being the man with his arms raised represents Messiah. Yod shows the hand clenched. Vav depicts the pegs driven into the Savior's wrist. And Tav is the cross that he died on. John 19, 19. So without the gift of Messiah, we would not even exist. For he is the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. Revelation 13, 8. Who has taken upon himself the death penalty for our sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the favorable gift of Elohim is everlasting life, Romans 6.23. And this is Yahweh's ultimate work, the Yod, for mankind. Now, if you write out the word Yod, it means arm or hand, and the numeric value of the word is 10, just as the letter is. And uh, 10 is the, a number marking Shalemut, or completion and order. And there were 10 things created on the first day, 10 things created at the end of the sixth day. And there are 10 generations from Adam to Noah, suggesting that godlessness of those generations was complete. There were 10 generations from Noah to Abraham, suggesting that the godliness of those generations was made complete. According to Midrash, there were 10 trials given to Abraham to demonstrate his merit. There were 10 plagues issued during the exodus of Egypt. God gave us 10 commandments, and he commanded that the 10th part of our increase should be returned to him. Leviticus 27:32. the 10th part shall be holy for Yahweh. Also, there are 10 days of awe, counting from Tishri 1 to Tishri 10, the day of atonement, culminating on Yom Kippur, which occurs on the 10th day of Tishri. So the concept of completion and order and of course, on the 10th day of Tishri, the completion of the opportunity to be saved will have come. Yod. So in the Yod, we see the work of Yah, the strength of Yah, yes, in doing his work. The fact that he is the Torah giver. The fact that he is the one that brings things to completion. And um, all of that is present in this asterism, in this constellation. Now, let's look at the next one. The next letter of Yahweh is He, and the He is in Orion. I know we're used to looking at Orion a certain way, but um, this would have been the letter that we get from Orion. And He is the word for behold, look, and I, and I, if I be lifted up, Yah says, will draw all men unto me. Um, this is the day of his being lifted up, taking out the anti-Messiah. And also the, the concept is look and live, behold and be wise. Recognize that the false system will not endure and that the true one is coming. In Orion, we see Christ portrayed as the mighty conqueror. And today, Orion is often depicted as a warrior holding a club and a shield but that wasn't the right view. It was a club and a lion. And um, it was a badly beaten lion. He's being held by the throat. Do you see that? And he has no strength to fight back in this depiction of him. Why is, why is Orion battling the lion? Well, because the lion is uh, normally representing Christ, right? But in this situation, the, the Antichrist has come. And the devil is a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. 
So for all who have been tempted by the devil and have suffered from his evil attacks or onslaught, Orion is the wonderful moment for which we've been waiting. Here, Christ is shown as having a concussive blow to the deceiving lion. Rendered unconscious, the lion dangles from Orion's mighty throat grip and his dark power is completely broken. He's no longer able to hunt for human prey. As Joe foretold, by the blast of God they perish and by the breath of his nostrils they are consumed. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The old lion perisheth for lack of prey. Job 4, 9 to 11. So in Amos 5, 8, we read, He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of his earth. Yahweh is his name. Okay, and here on the shoulder we have um, Bellatrix, as they call it today, and it means the sudden destroyer. So the strength in that arm to destroy the, the enemy. And we talked about this, Bosamach, the original name, the coming branch. Branch is a title of Messiah. He is the Messiah because he is the branch. And so the hay is, look, this is important. Behold this. Notice what Yah does by his spirit. Hay is also a representation of the breath of Yah and by his spirit. So let's look at hay. Hay today is drawn kind of like a lowercase n, but originally it was like a stick figure man with his hands up. Like, hey, stop, look like the letter, hey, <laughs> right? <laughs> so <laughs> this is uh, the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It stands for the number five in Hebrew, and it's pronounced with an H sound. And um, the ancient way that the letter was drawn agrees with the name of the letter. Um, and so it's, hey, behold. And uh, sometimes they think of the modern Hebrew as like behold or look through a window. Now, hey is the Hebrew letter for breath, spirit, and grace. And um, as Sharana mentioned today, Hebrew, the Hebrew concept of grace is not what we think. We think of grace as mercy. The Hebrew definition of mercy is what we think when we hear the word grace. But actually, grace is very graphically portrayed in the camp of the children of Israel. Grace is the sanctuary is in the middle of the camp. Yah is in the midst of them. They are camped around and he is their protection, their provision. He brings food. All the neighboring nations go, wow, they have a pillar of fire. They have a cloud by day. They have a very powerful God in their midst. We are not going to mess with those Israelites because we can see that they have a wonderful, powerful God in their midst, grace. But there is no such thing as cheap grace. What happens when the golden calf incident takes place? Well, there's a number of punishments. They have to drink colloidal gold. <laughs> colloidal gold is purgative, by the way. Colloidal gold is how Ford made the first taillights. By the way, what you do is you take gold and grind it up into a powder, which is exactly what uh, Moses commanded to be done with a golden calf. When it's ground up into powder, if it's put into a water suspension, do you know that it turns blood red? Yeah. So that, that liquid suspension of colloidal gold made the first taillights red. Well, colloidal gold, they were drinking it, and it was a graphic demonstration to them. You have sinned. That sin costs blood. Blood will have to be shed for you. And you need to get your noxiousness out. And they would have been very cleansed. <laughs> and, there, <laughs> and there were other punishments. And there's quite a list, actually, of things that Yah did to say this is not okay. No. No. But you know what I think the worst one is? Yah moved out. He was not in the midst of the camp anymore. He had Moses take the sanctuary outside for some distance out so that they would know there is no grace for your idolatry. 
And what do they have if they have not Yah? What do they have? Doesn't he do everything? They breathe because of him. He rains, he rains food for them. But there is no cheap grace. No. Grace doesn't go on while we are idolatrous. So grace is Yah in his people. Yah within. Yah in the midst. And that's the concept of hey. The hey is the letter of grace. Behold, pay attention. This is important. That's what that letter tells us. This is the breath of heaven. This is the spirit of Yah. This is grace. When you have grace, can anything stop you? Do we have to worry about any resistance whatsoever? If Yah is with his people, is there any power? Exactly. Do you see what grace? Oh my, grace is big, guys. Grace is big and beautiful. Hey is the first letter in the Hebrew word henna, which is behold in English. And it suggests that something important is following, which can only be viewed and fully appreciated through the Holy Spirit. And the concept is found in a couple of behold verses like, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And that's the meaning of the asterism hey in Orion. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And this is him. That's him. Enoch, in those church scenes at night, I can imagine telling, that's the hay. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and all that that means. There's another aspect of hay. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. Look and live. And what happened in the, with the children of Israel when they put the serpent on the stick to show that this is Yeshua taking your noxiousness, everything that the serpent's done to you, he's going to hang on the cross. And this is what this represents, that he has to die for all that you got from the serpent. And when he dies on the cross, it will kill the snake in you. If you look and live. Look and live. That's what they said. Because by beholding what happens to us, we are changed. There's power in the hay. Behold! Because by beholding, we become changed. Psalms 150, verse 6, Let everything that hath breath, heh, praise Yahweh, praise ye Yahweh. It's interesting to me that when Yah wants to change someone's character, he changes their name. Do you know what is the most common thing for him to do to someone's name? Add a hey. Abram became Abraham, the hey. Sarai became Sarah, the hey, to show that his spirit is there, that they have beheld, that they are beholding, that they have his grace, that they have his spirit. Quickened, filled with his spirit. Psalms 18, 28. For thou wilt light my candle, Yahweh my Elohim will enlighten my darkness. Hey signifies the window of the soul, the light and breath of heaven coming in and to be truly a citizen of the heavenly realm, even though you walk on earth. So there are two Hays in Yah's holy covenant name. yod Hay, vav Hay, emphasis. They show that he breathed life into us at the beginning and he breathes eternal life into us. If we are only physically alive, it's like we're zombies. We need to be spiritually alive. So it's interesting, too, that the hey is in the Hebrew word, hallelujah. Let everything that hath breath praise Yahweh. Hey represents Yah's creative power. By the word of Yahweh were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. There's a direct link to hey and breath and word. <clears throat> and breath in Hebrew writing refers to the sound of the letter He, the outbreathing of the spirit. Okay, Yod, He, then Vav, and then another He. So let's look at the Vav. And the Vav is in the lamb, which today they've made into a ram. 
but all the ancient depictions of it were a lamb. And this is indeed, it's true that a ram is also a sacrificial animal, but this is not a ram. This is worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelations 5.12, that at the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and of things under the earth. That even includes the demonic realm. And so Tala is the name of this constellation. It's one of the most powerful yet amazingly unassuming of images in the sky. In this eighth of the primary constellations, Messiah is depicted as the conqueror. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Really? Isn't that amazing? I love the story of the um, a Waldensian youth in the time of the Inquisition. The Waldenses were, we, have, we owe those people a lot. Yah used them and they preserved the scriptures by sewing them into their clothes, by memorizing them, having their children memorize scripture, huge amounts of scripture because parents were being killed. Children usually would survive. And so to preserve the scriptures, they had their kids memorize and they, would, they, could, they could say the Bible. I mean, they were keeping the word of Yah. They lived up in the Alps up high in the mountains, and they weren't the only ones. They had a number of little um, names and things. The papacy wanted them to look like a small group of people, so they gave them, you know, the voudois. They gave them the, <laughs> the cathari. They gave them all kinds of names, but they were the Walden Seas. They were Torah keepers, and they were Torah keepers well into the Inquisition, and... Um, it was very dangerous to do what they did. They would come down into the villages as merchants and they would have the scriptures sewn into their clothes in the time when you weren't allowed to hear the Bible. You would go to the Catholic church, that was the only one that was allowed. And if you went to the Catholic church, it was all in Latin intentionally. They didn't want any of the regular people to understand or know anything about the word of God. So the only thing you got was not, not suggesting they were teaching the word of God, but even a, a twisted version, they weren't even getting that. And, um, they would just have the stained glass windows. Well, that, that's a cool, yeah, wonder what that is. I don't know. And go home and, well, we, we did whatever was required of us and that was it. They were starving. It's why it's called the time of darkness, great darkness. And um, it wasn't the age of enlightenment coming after just because there were all these scientific things. It was because the word of God came to the people. Well, the Walden Seas largely did that. And at great risk, they would come down into those valleys and into those villages and knock on doors. We have some wares to sell. And they'd come into the house. Do you know what would happen to them if they revealed that they had scriptures to the wrong person? Imprisoned, beheaded, burned at the stake. There was a tremendous amount of cost. Also, they had to hand do those copies that they had. There were no printing presses in those days. So the loss of the scriptures was epic. And that to them was the biggest treasure they brought. And they would lay out their wares and they would pray because they had really come to share God with these people. And in that sales transaction that might be going on, if they felt like they could, they would say, would you like to hear the scriptures? And I can imagine the people recoiling in shock. <gasps> you have that? Why, we could all die. <laughs> but people were hungry and they would read to them the scriptures. And then they would say, we can come back and we can bring some more. And the young men in the, in the high mountain valleys of the Walden Seas, they would be taught to do this missionary work. And they would come down. Well, one young man, he had come down into the valleys to do that missionary work and the inquisitors were on to him. They knew he was there and they were coming after him and he heard whisperings, you better get out of here quick because they're coming for you. And so he ran. And while he was running, he realized they're on my tail too close. I can't go home or I'll lead them to my people, my family, 
They used to worship God up in those mountains and have peace up there and the bad guys couldn't get them. And I think of the things that the scripture says about the mountains. It says we'll flee to the mountains in the end too. Interesting, huh? Well, that's exactly what the Waldenses did. They fled to the mountains. So this young man, he couldn't go home. What was he going to do? And he cried out to God. Please, Father, show me where to go. What shall I do? I don't want to endanger any of my loved ones, and I'm going to die if you don't intervene. And Yah impressed him, go into this cave. And so there in the, in the rocks and whatever, he found this cave. And okay, I'm going to go in the cave. Now, this is a dead end, but God told him to go in. And so he runs into the cave, and these people are searching for him. It's not going to be long before they come on the very trail that he's on. But while he's in there, he sees a spider and the spider comes and it works on a web. And this this story actually inspired one of Martin Luther's hymns. And it put that web over the mouth of the cave and just had finished when the troops came. And he heard them coming and he's back in the shadows in the cave praying, got his eyes closed, you know, and opens to see Oh no, what's going to happen? I'm going to trust Yah with my life here, of course. And they say, ah, he's not in the cave. If he were in the cave, what? He would have broken the spider's web when he went in. And so they went on looking elsewhere and he was able eventually to go home safely. And that story inspired a mighty fortress is our God, a wall that will not falter. Because the reality is that the same wonderful God who saves people with a lamb can make a spider's web a wall or a wall a spider's web. (laughs) Isn't God wonderful? Tala is the name of this constellation and it shows the incredible strength of heaven to provide for our salvation. And so this is the one who has provided salvation Wonderful, merciful Savior, we sing, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? And yet he does. And there's going to be a moment in time, just before the second coming, and in the Maseroth, it's right after the two fish. So the time of persecution is over. And there, there can be no more martyrs, because Yah will not allow one drop of martyr blood when there's no good to come from it. The Bible says, all things work together for good to those who love Yah, who are called according to his purpose. When the final day of atonement happens and nobody else can be saved or lost, no more martyrdom. And that is the day, that final day of atonement is the day when every knee will bow at the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. And so that's what this constellation is all about. That moment when he is glorified. So the star that you see here, Al Sheraton, it means the one who was wounded, smitten, slaughtered even. And it appears in scripture in Zechariah 13, 6. Over here we have Masartim, And it means the one who was bound, chastisement, bond, punishment, stripes. And you recognize that that is a connection to Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions, and by his stripes we are healed. And that, by the way, is part of the Vav. The brightest stars are in the Vav, coming across the top and through the eyes of Tala. Then we have Al-Hamal, the other eye, and it means the sheep. Um, And this one is in Isaiah 53, 7. Now let's look at the Vav. The last Hebrew letter, um, uh, uh, well, this one is the sixth Hebrew letter. We'll just say that. And it signifies the nail, the peg, the hook. Okay. And so the picture of a wooden peg or nail can be seen in the ancient character. And this is the way that it was drawn before it was drawn like that. So the most ancient representation of the Vav looks more like the Y. And Vav can serve as V or W in sound. And um, I have heard that it's more likely that Vavs were actually Wuss. 
more likely W's. And that's often why my husband and I tend to say Yahweh. We're not militant about it, but um, people who did the Word of Yahweh Bible have some interesting documentation on that, that, that the oldest pronunciation of the Vav would have been probably the W. Anyway, so here's the Vav. And because of its connective meaning, when the letter Vav is added to the front of the Hebrew word, it means and. So it means to connect things. And that's very important. Um, Vav is used in Exodus 20, verse 13, for the sixth commandment. And the pictograph of a hook or nail symbolizes one being joined together, connected with, to be made secure, to become bound to or nailed to. So Vav is hook or nail in Hebrew. And it also is and because it connects. Now Yeshua hooks or connects heaven with earth. And Yahweh is spelled, as we are looking, yod Hey vav Hey, And Yahweh and man are connected together through the worthy lamb that was slain. He is the Vav, the connection of heaven with earth. Is there any way to connect with heaven without the lamb? And that's why the Vav is in the lamb. Now, by joining heaven and earth, it implies the connection between spiritual and earthly matters. And so it's interesting. Um, it occurs in the 22nd letter in the Torah attached to the sixth word. And it alludes to the creative connection between all the letters. And Vav is therefore co the connection, connecting force of Yah, the divine hook that binds together heaven and earth. The first Vav in the Torah occurs in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. And in the beginning, earth, vav, and heavens, and God created them. Now, vav is also in the sanctuary, the tabernacle, the mishkan, as they call it. The vav is used in Exodus 27, 9 to 10 to refer to the hooks of silver fastened to posts called amudim that were used to hold the curtain, the wall, and enclose the tabernacle. And the tabernacle represents the throne or house of Yah coming to earth. So it literally is connected to the earth by the vavs. And just as the tabernacle was the habitation of Yah while the Israelites traveled in the wilderness, so the Torah is the habitation of his word. And so it's very interesting that the scribes uh, developed the idea of the Torah scroll being constructed like the tabernacle. And they call each parchment sheet of a scroll the Yiria, which is the name for the curtain of the tabernacle. And there are roughly 50 Yirio per scroll. And each column of the text, an Amud, named for the post of the tabernacle's court. And since each curtain of the tabernacle was fastened to its post by means of a silver hook or a Vav, the scribes made each column of text to begin with a letter Vav and hooking the text to the parchment. That's just interesting. But um, also the belly of the Torah is connected with the Vav. An oversized Vav marks the center or belly of the entire Torah. And that's in Leviticus 11.42. It says, whatsoever goeth upon the belly, and there's a Vav in there, and whatsoever goeth upon all four. <laughs> and so that is marking the center point. There's an interesting way of doing the Vav um, in regards to the covenant of peace. There's a broken Vav. And so uh, there is a law concerning the writing of the Torah scrolls that all Hebrew letters are be well formed, that no letters can be uh, touch other letters and no letters can be malformed or broken or otherwise illegible. However, there's a strange exception to that rule regarding the Vav that appears in the word Shalom in Numbers 25, 12. So behold, I am giving him my covenant of peace in the Torah scroll. Shalom would be written like this. And there's the broken Vav in there. So the story in Numbers 25 is about Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, the priest, and his zeal to remove evil from Israel by driving a spear, literally a Vav, through a man who was fornicating with a Moabite woman. And on account of Phineas's act, God stopped the plague and Israel was delivered from destruction. 
From a messianic point of view, we can see that Phineas is a type of Yeshua since it is written that he was zealous or jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel, it says in Numbers 25, 13. And on a deeper level, we can further think of this broken vav as a picture of the brokenness of Messiah for our ultimate deliverance from spiritual adultery. And since uh, the vav represents the number of man, the broken vav represents the man that is broken for our transgressions. Um, for the sake of the covenant of peace, Messiah, the deliverer, is broken. And so that represents Messiah by the broken vav. Six is also the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day and was given six days each week to labor, just as Yah labored for six days in creating the world. And so Vav represents um, man and six and sixth day. And there are six millennia before the coming of the Messiah. Interestingly enough, the beast identified as the number of a man is 666. Okay, then we come to our last hay. And this one is the second um, depiction of the hay um, is in an interesting constellation here where we have the strong man wrestling the snake. Now, if you were looking at the tapestry of the heavens, you would see that the snake is reaching its head up in the, in the con constellation tapestry to grab something above it, and it's the northern crown. The crown representing the opportunity for you and me to be saved. Eternal life is emblemized in the crown. The snake reaching his head up to take the crown. What does the Bible say? Hold fast what thou hast. Let no man take thy crown. And um, man, we don't wrestle flesh and blood. So the snake is trying to take the crown. But behold, the mighty one who battles the serpent. And that, of course, is a symbol of Yeshua. Now, this particular, um, this particular sky picture is Genesis 3.15 in the heavens. Uh, we'll look at that in more detail later on. So the seed of the righteous versus the seed of Satan is being talked about here. The seed of the righteous will be delivered from the snake. Um, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And it's the concept of victory with his weapons, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through Yah, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now I'm going to explain this constellation in detail when we go into the wisdom and warfare in the Hebrew stars. But for now, let me just say that this is a depiction of Genesis 3.15. He will be wounded in the heel and he will bruise the serpent's head. And it's the strong man battling the snake that does it. And so the hay is there. Spiritual life is here. This is the window to spiritual life, to have Yeshua as your Messiah and to have his victory in the life. So where do we find the name of Yahweh? We find the Yod in Re'ah, the good shepherd. We find the hay in Orion, he is coming. Behold the coming one. We find the Vav in the one who joined heaven with earth. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. And we find the hay again in the message of spiritual warfare and victory in Messiah. So that's Yahweh in the heavens. And with that, we're going to conclude. And then tomorrow, when we pick it up, we'll be looking at Torah in the, in the heavens. Let's bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name. You are almighty, and we are just so blessed by all that you are in our life, the good shepherd, the one who cuts off wickedness. You are the king who supports your people. You are the coming one who will deal the death blow to the anti-Messiah. You are the great I am. And... We just uh, worship you in all of the roles that you have in our lives and beyond, and we give you thanks. And I pray that each and every one of us will personally avail ourselves of the opportunity to belong to you. And 
We praise you for that too in Yeshua's name. Amen.